So when I had Jackie McBride on the show a couple of months back, she told me, she, she connected me with two different individuals. One was Greg Kite, who you guys have heard from on the podcast. If you haven't, go check out that interview as well. And then she told me about Dave, Dave Porter. And she told me, hey, uh, it'll be about a month or two um, and he'll be ready to be able to do an interview. Um, and I am so grateful that I got to circle back with him and, and get him on the podcast because today's interview is super special. We're talking to a tennis legend. He coached for over 40 years. Um, he's a BYU grad. Uh, he's coached at the collegiate level, the professional level. He understands tennis very, very well. And there's some amazing insights that he'll bring to the to the show today. Even if you're not a tennis player or you even aren't even a tennis fan, there are a lot of uh, life lessons you can learn from the sport. And you'll get to hear from him. We'll talk about some of the athletes he's coached, some of the memories he's had, the life lessons that he's learned. We'll talk about the training that's required to compete in tennis. And we'll talk about the difference between collegiate athletes and professional level athletes. Um, you might enjoy that one quite a bit, actually. So make sure to t uh, tap into this one, even if you're not a tennis player. And for those who are tennis players, you're really going to love this one. So make sure to take notes um, on the podcast. I appreciate you guys tuning in. This is the Game Time Guru. So what time is it? Game Time Guru. This is the Game Time Guru podcast, where I interview sports figures from all over the world to help deliver a panoramic view on sports. So whether you're a former athlete, one of the crazies, or simply a casual sports fan, this is the perfect show for you as we peel back the curtains and learn from our guests every single week. I'm your host, Shane Larson, and I'm helping you see sports through a different lens. What's up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of the Game Time Guru Podcast. My name is Shane Larson, host of the show. Excited to be here with you guys today for yet another interview. Um, this is a special opportunity for me to, to you know, shout out my previous guest on the show, Jackie, uh, Jackie McBride. Um, she joined the show. She's connected me with our guest today. His name is Dave Porter. We're going to be talking about his, his amazing career as a tennis coach, uh, recently retired in the last year or so from BYU Tennis. Uh, we're going to learn about the ins and outs of the sport. I want to give a shout out to everybody who's tuned in over the last eight years. Um, anybody who's tuned in over the 182 countries that we're in, all 50 states, everybody who's listened, everybody who's joined, welcome aboard. If this is your first time listening to the show, though, make sure to hit us with that follow. I'm trying to build out the YouTube following this year, uh, something I've never actually really taken seriously until 2024. And so I would love for you guys to fo uh, follow me over on YouTube. And you can check out all the social media platforms as well. But joining us is the man, the myth, the legend. His name is Dave Porter. Dave, thanks for joining the show, sir. Happy to be here. Yes, sir. All right. So let's talk about the sport of tennis. Uh, I get to know you a little bit better um, from before the coach, uh, Dave Porter. Let's talk about, you know, just the athlete, Dave Porter. And so, Dave, let's talk about your athletic uh, career coming up as a youth and just kind of your sports background as a whole, if you wouldn't mind, you know, kind of sharing some of your your insight with us? Well, I played a lot of sports growing up. It was a long time ago, and it was a time when yeah, everybody didn't specialize when they were six or seven or eight years old and and basically played everything. Um, <clears throat> I, I enjoyed playing baseball and played baseball for a while. Um, had an interesting experience with baseball that turned me to tennis, and that was that I was a pitcher and I threw the ball real hard. And uh, through maybe too far inside, hit some kids as a pitcher, and the parents were complaining that their kids were afraid to bat when I was pitching. And so they, the coach said, oh, you're going to put your shortstop. And I said, why? And he said, well, you know, you throw hard, and the kids are afraid to be up, up at bat, and we're just trying to all learn, and, <laughs> and so you're not going to pitch anymore. So that's when, one of the reasons that I switched and went to tennis. I just said, well, if I'm not going to pitch, you know, I'm, I'm not going to play. And my aunt, I had an aunt who was the Utah State women's singles champion. Oh, wow. And so she sort of got my brother, older brother and I playing. And he also played at BYU and was a, a good tennis player. He's the, uh, one of the, he holds the IBM chair for government at Harvard's Kennedy School, uh, graduate school. And so we, we both grew up playing tennis. And, uh, and uh, then when I got to high school, I played, uh, ran cross country, played football, basketball, and tennis. Wow. Okay. So here's some I want to unbox with you, Dave, on, on that front. That's actually really insightful. You did mention something. This was before the times where everybody specializes in a sport. And I think um, that's relatively like new to the 
to the sports world, it seems like now, um, even from the time I was playing in high school. I mean, it's only been 18 years since I graduated, but uh, it does seem like that's the case now. I wanted to ask your opinion on this. Being a multi-sport athlete, competing in a variety of sports, especially at a young age, getting you, you know, familiar with different styles of athletics. Uh, how do you feel that benefited you even, I guess, baseball to tennis or anything else to tennis? Like, did they, all, did they, did they benefit each other? I want to know your opinion on multi-sport athletes. Well, there's a lot of transfer from one sport to another. Uh, most of the transfer is positive. Some of it can be negative, but most of the, most of the transfer is positive. And that has to do with footwork, movement, anticipation, hand-eye coordination, conditioning, uh, the mental portion of whatever sport you're playing in, all those things tend to cross the lines. And uh, so whatever you choose to play, that can be helpful. And I think that for me, I'm glad I grew up in the generation that I did in that I think for me to focus on one thing at a really early age would have taken away a lot of the joy that I had. I enjoyed playing team sports and I certainly enjoyed and have spent my life with more of an individual sport. So I think there's advantages to both, and I think there's lessons to be learned from both. And I think that if you are only doing one, you risk losing some of the benefits of athletics. I appreciate that insight. I wish more athletes would take note of that. So if you're listening to this, you're a parent, you're you're an athlete, take note of that. I know it is a, a we're in a time where like club sports and I'm, I'm a coach for club basketball. I see it all the time though. It's like, it's year round and, and kids feel like if they're not playing in that specific sport year round, they're falling behind. And I actually feel like they're, that's, that's not accurate. I think, um, you can benefit just like Dave was saying. I think, I feel like the athletes can benefit from playing in multiple sports and in fact, gain an advantage in some ways, just because of the different ways, like the things that you just mentioned, along with some other stuff, I feel like there's just such a benefit competing with different types of athletes, different types of coaching, uh, different scenarios, you know, different in-game scenarios and, and training scenarios. Like there's just different things that, that, you know, go, go together for that. And so, um, it's good to hear from somebody who, who understands that now, Dave, when you, um, were competing, did you go, uh, to college to compete in, 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 in sports? Did you get to compete at the collegiate level? I did. And, and as a freshman, I was, uh, recruited to BYU and I played there as a freshman. And, uh, that was, in the days when freshmen couldn't play varsity. And so we, we were very, very good, mostly because of one particular player, but we had a number of good players. But Kreshmer Chosic, who was following his graduation from college, uh, went back to Yugoslavia and coached uh, and played as a player coach for the 1980 Yugoslav team that won the gold medal in the Olympics when we didn't go because of Afghanistan. So, I mean, he was he was the number number three pick by the Boston Celtics, but he, he played just in his home country and and played for his country. So we had a really good team. We we played the varsity in the Frosh varsity game. <clears throat> we lost by five points. He had three dunks that were taken away because back then because of uh, Lou Alcindor at the time, later Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, dunking wasn't allowed. And so he it was obviously an international ball and in the Olympics. And so he had those taken away or we would have probably beaten our varsity that year. So I was able to do that. And then I left on a mission for our church and I was gone for two years. And um, when I came back, they had uh, they had some better players than I was. I mean, I started as a point guard uh, as a freshman. And when I got back, uh, I could see that I, I was not going to play unless we were way ahead or way behind. And so I first year back, I started doing both and we'd finish basketball practice. I'd go play tennis. And then I just played tennis from then on. Wow, man. That's actually really cool. It's, it's funny. I, I had Greg kite on the show, uh, probably about two or three months ago. And then I also had, um, my, uh, Mike Lacey, I believe was on the show and, yeah. uh, would just share like people from the era of which you were there. It seems like you guys had a, a group of like amazing, athletes in that era. It's just called cool. Jackie being one of them as well. Like, it's just like the coolest, like group of people. I, I serve in, in the church with a man named David Tidwell and his younger brother, Niels was also there in that era. And like, it just seems like that was a good era of people at BYU. It's crazy. Where did you serve your mission? If you don't mind me asking Dave, I went to new England, the headquarters in Cambridge. Uh, oh, sweet. So I was pretty close to where my brother ended up at Harvard. 
and for the main part, but it was good because it was uh, very historical in terms of our country in Boston and very historical with regards to the church. Nine of the first 12 members of the Quorum of the Twelve were born in Vermont. And that was the first area that I served on my mission up near where the Joseph Smith Memorial is located. Wow, that is so cool, man. What a cool thing. I served in Brazil for my two-year mission, but definitely not as, as cool as New England with the historical stuff. You know what I mean? Um, question for you. You know, you mentioned when you came back, Dave, from, from a mission, uh, personnel was different on the basketball squad. So you were, you know, competing in tennis and so forth as well. But like, uh, how did you get yourself back into shape? I like to ask uh, former missionaries the same question. Um, it's something that doesn't get talked about enough, I don't feel like. But how did you feel like you got back into shape after serving two years of a mission? Because for me, I came back weak. I was like 170 pounds, just skinny as a rail when I came home from my mission. I was not athletic anymore at all. Two years kind of took a toll on me. Uh, everybody's different, but there's no way I would have been able to compete at the collegiate level at least within a year of coming back home. So I'm just curious for you, like how did you get yourself back into shape to compete at the collegiate level? Well, to be perfectly honest, I tried my best and feel like I did a pretty good job of staying in shape while I was on my mission. Um, later, after I finished playing tennis and uh, started on my master's degree at BYU, I was hired uh, to be on the faculty and I was running the missionary training missionary training center uh, athletic area. So while I was there, I developed a program that I had used on my mission for myself. And it was, we went up to the 47 East South Temple and took some missionaries with us that were going to Brazil, couldn't get visas. So they'd learned all the, they'd learned all the discussions in Portuguese. Then they learned them in Spanish. Then they learned them in English. They were there for six months. And finally they, they got to, to head to Brazil. But um, I developed a program that you can do by yourself next to the side of your bed uh, on a, being on a completely different level as the person that's doing it next to you. And we had every missionary in the church was doing it for two or three years and then they made it optional and then it sort of dwindled. But it was called Time Dex and that was something that I had developed and, and, uh, and did while I was on my mission to try to stay in shape. Wow, that's actually really cool. That's so awesome. Uh I wish that was more mandatory now uh, for everybody, for that matter. Uh, working out on a mission was not easy for everybody, uh, but like doing the stuff in the house, you can still do it. I felt like I did a pretty good job at like doing pushups every morning and whatnot. But I'll tell you what, when I came home trying to lift traditional weights and uh, play basketball again and like get my knees back into shape for like jumping, it took me a good six months to a year to feel like I was back to normal. But that's awesome that you did that, Dave. I, I wanted to pick your brain on this. So, what was your favorite memory playing collegiate tennis? Like if you were like as a collegiate tennis player, what was your favorite memory? What was the biggest thing you said you would say you learned or the biggest transition from high school to college or whatever it might be during your college experience at BYU? I think that when I was playing tennis, I was able to get to the realization that this is all depends on me. And when I was playing basketball before, yeah, it was a large part of me, but, I mean, you can't hide on the court, but on the, on the, on the basketball court, but if you're not feeling like you're shooting well, you pass off more. I'm setting up plays. I focus more on rebounding or playing defense. Uh, if I was having a great shooting night, I'd let the other guard know and, and sort of without really talking it over with the coaches shift to the two guard in terms of having the play where, where I get more shots. So uh, but you can't do that when you're playing tennis. It's all there for you. In fact, I'll tell you something interesting. We, I was uh, <clears throat> worked for a long time with the United States Professional Tennis Association. It actually, was the president of that organization for a couple of years. We had a world conference with about, I'd say, 3,000 tennis coaches in Las Vegas. It was right after the U.S. Open had ended. And we, because Andre Agassi is from Vegas, we got him to come down and and talk with the pros. And uh, it was right after he had lost a very close four set match in the semifinals to Pete Sampras. Oh, wow. And so they asked him, you know, what question, do any of you have questions? One of the, one of the pros raised his hand and he, and he asked Andre and he said, so, so tell me what, who are the better athletes, basketball players or tennis players? 
And he says, well, basketball players, if they're having a bad day, they, they, they get put on the bench and they still make their money and they're just sitting there watching the game. He said, tennis players, you're having a bad day. You got you to find a way to win and you got to just stay and play. But on the other hand, if Michael Jordan played tennis, I would have retired a long time ago. <laughs> so, so basically, there's a lot of things to learn from it. And one of them is that it depends on you, but there are some limitations. And I look at the athletes, <coughs> excuse me, I look at the athletes today and how fast they are and how big they are. I mean, I was, I'm 6'2", and I was big for a tennis player. Oh, wow. There, was, there were a couple other guys that were my size, but most of them were 5'10", 5'11", maybe six foot. And, uh, and, and the pros, I mean, Rod Laver, is the only guy that's ever won the Grand Slam twice. He's like 5'6". But now, I mean, you watch that match today, Taylor Fritz, he's, he's 6'5", and he played at Zverev, and he's 6'5". These are big guys, and they're fast. They cover the court, and they're strong, and they hit hard. It, the game's changed a lot since uh, since when we were playing, since I was playing. Wow, it it definitely has evolved, I'm sure. But that's it's so it's so uh, cool and very accurate. I would say that that statement about you know in basketball, if you're playing poorly, sit the bench. But like in in uh, tennis, you don't get that opportunity. It's like you're you got to fight through the storm. Yeah. Um, that's another thing I wanted to ask you. You know, myself, I was a boxer, and I actually felt that way a little bit myself. When it came to the individual sports versus the team sports, and that's why I love being a multi-sport athlete, it was boxing taught me that you have to kind of just meet the issues head on and make the adjustments or you're going to get hurt. Like you have to figure it out. Um, if you're having a bad day, that's fine, but you're going to have to figure it out or else you're going to get hurt. And I really felt like there was some, there's some substance to that with, with, with tennis as well. What would you say after having played and coached, uh, you, you know, for those who are listening, you were a coach for over 40 years. You coached for over 40 years and you have a lot of experience. What would you say uh, if you're giving advice to people, Dave, in regards to overcoming adversity, like handling the storm? What's one of the best practices you yourself or maybe a, uh, an athlete that you've coached, male or female, um, that you've noticed that's, that's a good practice to be able to overcome the adversity if you are having a bad day? How do you kind of snap out of it to keep your mind focused to continue on? Well, a basketball coach that I had a long time ago used to say, if it is to be, it's up to me. And so developing an attitude at it from an early age that if this is going to happen, I'm the, I'm going to be the difference maker. It's going to, it's my responsibility. And I'm not going to point my finger and blame other people. And I've even had tennis players say that I've coached say, I really don't like singles so much because when I'm playing doubles, if something goes wrong, there's always somebody else that, you know, it's their fault too. And I'm going, you got to learn how to take responsibility. You got to learn how to say, no, this is on me. This is up to me. If, if I don't win or we don't win, what did I, what <coughs> could I have changed in order to have made a difference? And how could I possibly uh, impact my, my teammates? If it's a team, if it's a, a team match, even though I'm playing individually, I've still got the, the whole team that I'm, I'm, uh, <coughs> you know, responsible for. So as far as I'm concerned, you know, learning how to take responsibility, that's one of the great things about athletics in general. I think that's what kids should learn. You know, I got to show up on time. I got to work hard. I've got to, I got to give my best every single day. And, and those are things that I think are the difference makers with those that are successful and those that just play. No, I love that. I love that. Quick reminder, if it is to be, it's up to me taking accountability, taking ownership, and, and pushing through. That's so cool. Um, I want to ask your, you know, obviously I, I knew you as the coach, but I want to know, like it, maybe if you rewind the clock a little bit, I want to know about the transition from playing to coaching, because for me, Dave, coaching is a little bit different of an animal. Uh, you don't have as much say in, in regards to like, you have a lot of say, but you don't have, you don't have the ability to actually act. Right. So when I'm coaching basketball and I'm asking these kids that are in high school, to like, you know, we've got to do X, Y, and Z. And like, ultimately you don't have any way to execute. And so that was a hard transition for me when I started coaching four years ago. Like it was a, it was a hard transition. I wanted to know about you and the coaching transition from playing to coaching. Do you remember there, there being any sort of difficult transition there or was it just natural for you? Well, I was still in high school 
I was a junior in high school and two gentlemen in the community, one was a very successful stockbroker, one was a very successful dentist. And they both played tennis and basketball at BYU. And they sponsored a little league baseball team. And they came and got me out of school and sat me down and said, we want you to coach because our sons play on this team. And I said, I'm playing tennis all the time now. I mean, I I don't do baseball anymore. And I said, besides, look, you need somebody older. And he goes, nope, everybody else is is somebody's parents. And we want somebody that's going to give time to the kids and understands them and cares about them. So I started coaching when I was, you know, 16 or 17. And we were very successful. And it mostly wasn't because I was good. It was because we just practiced more than everybody else. They'd all practice on Wednesday nights and have games on Saturday, you know, because their parents were coaching. And we practice every single day during the summer. So I think that just as a result of that, we, we, we got better than most teams and we were very, very good. And so I felt like I learned some things that helped me when I got into coaching uh, high school teams uh, and college teams and even professional athletes. So um, I learned that everybody learns at different rates. I can't treat everybody like they're me. I remember when Bill Russell retired and they said, why are you retiring? At this time, he was the coach for the Seattle Supersonics. He'd, le- he'd left the Celtics and he was a coach for Seattle. And he said, because I treat all the players like they're me and they're not. And um, so I, I think that, uh, you know, the, the, main, the main part for me then was what do I, what, 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 what do I need to do and how can I do it? And I learned on these younger kids what would motivate them. I learned to have a little bit more compassion than I did as a player. It was like, hey, you work hard or you're, you're sitting on the bench. And these kids are out there trying as hard as they can. They're playing because their parents want them to play. And so, you know, it was an opportunity for me to learn a little bit about myself and about being patient and about thinking about others. And we were still able to be somewhat successful. Man, that's so cool. I appreciate the insight there, too. It's, I think a lot of us can relate to that, so I appreciate that. Now, Dave, if you um, if you could walk us through like a training session, I want to – for those who might not be – like tennis players. Um, I, you know, I, I'm, I've been blessed to have a couple of friends of mine who've played high level tennis. I myself did not play, but it, it was insightful to me because as someone who grew up playing basketball and football, and then I was a boxer, I, uh, never really thought of tennis as like this high stressful, like athletic activity. Right. So I never really had the respect. I don't, I don't believe that, that I should have for tennis, until they started showing me what they did for practices and how they kept their bodies in shape and the types of movements they did. And then I started playing with them. Um, I would go in there and play and there was like the skill alone just to keep the ball within the court and hit it at a high speed and just the right angles and so forth. It was, it was tough enough, but going side to side, stopping back and forth, the, the endurance that it required was another, another animal. So if you wouldn't mind, could you walk us through like as a coach, what you did as far as like a, your trainings with your, your programs? Like what was a, a training session like for a tennis player from a physical standpoint and a skill standpoint? Well, for us, and most of the reason that the things that I'm going to tell you about are in the order that they're in were because of our facilities and our having to share facilities like the weight room and whatever with other teams. So, but we would start out at practice and, and from the very beginning, we would start playing a game we called short court, which is inside the service boxes. And we would play and the losers had to run because most people stand there and they're warming up and they're hitting back and forth. And they're saying, oh, did you see that new movie that came out? Or what, what did you remember from biology today or something? I don't, no, no, no. We're here. This is what we're doing. And you're going to focus and you're going to try from the very first moment. I mean, after we've stretched and jogged and, you know, warmed our warmed the muscles up, we're playing and we're competing. And competing is really what you're out there doing. And so every drill that we would do and every game that we would play had an element of competition. And it was sometimes it was competitive. Sometimes it was cooperative. I'm playing against you. I'm trying to beat you. Or you and I are trying to achieve a higher number of consecutive hits in a designated area than the two guys on the court next to us. So we're cooperating, 
but we're competing against someone else or I'm competing against the one I'm hitting with. But either way, there's an element of competition that required a physiological change. So when, when you're playing and you, you get nervous or you get tight, your body secretes different chemicals than when you're just having fun and you're relaxed. So if I'm trying to win and I'm competing hard, my body's creating a different environment for me to be hitting the tennis ball in than it is if I'm just playing for fun. Yeah. So if we're practicing and practice is fun and we're just playing around, yeah, we get better. We get a little bit of fitness. We burn off some calories. We get a little bit more muscle strength. We practice hitting balls. It does not prepare us for the match. Because when the match comes, we have different chemicals going on inside of our body, and it's a different environment hitting the tennis ball, like shooting a free throw under pressure and shooting it before the team comes out for you if you're coaching basketball. So you've got to say, find a way to create the pressure of that free throw in a practice situation like it will be in a game situation. And that's what we tried to do with tennis, um, whether it was a drill, whether we were playing sets, whatever it was. Man, and when we do our gym, like straight, when we do straight conditioning, we lifted weights three times a week, uh, and we go to the weight room and we work with a strength and conditioning coach who would assist us. We did a lot of flexibility on the court, but tennis is a game of moving, and uh, and and changing directions, as you mentioned. And um, actually, in a normal average tennis point, you change directions nine to twelve times. It's not just running in a straight line. It's changing directions and being on balance. And uh, probably the best female player that I had at the university, not some of the pros that I worked with, but at the university. And she was number 165 in the world, WTA. I mean, she played the U.S. Open qualities and then came to school. And she, we'd run sprints and she was bottom third all the time. But on the court, she covered the court better than anybody because she changed. She saw she read the ball. She changed directions. And her first step was really quick. She didn't keep it up for 100 yards, but she'd keep it up to the sideline in order to hit the ball and move back again. So there's a different kind of fitness for tennis because of the nature of how the game is played than it is for certain other sports. Soccer, you got to be able to run forever. Tennis, I play a 10 second point. I get a 25 second rest. Yeah. And then I play again. So it's 60% anaerobic and 40% aerobic. So we had to do a lot of sprints, but we also had to have a good aerobic base. And that came from running a little bit further distances in order to prepare for the anaerobic portion. Man, that is so insightful. I appreciate you sharing that. And what I really loved is something that I took note of while you were talking. I have my phone right here. I always take note of this stuff is, is from the physiological standpoint of just trying to like recreate those situations where the chemicals are going to be similar in your body. It's so cool to hear somebody say that because I try to tell the kids that I coach that Dave, I'm like in basketball, we'll be doing sprints. Uh, and then I make them do their free throws right after the sprints. And if they miss, we're running again and we're going to go until everybody's shot their free throws. And we've hit, somebody has to hit two in a row until somebody hits two in a row. We're running, we're running, we're running. And like, I try to make noise. Then I try to be silent. I try to do, recreate certain situations. And yeah, you're not going to always be able to replicate it to a hundred percent, but like you can do certain things because your body reacts differently when it's under stress physically and under stress mentally. Um, and the way that you perform, like the, the chemical reactions in your body are so much different. And so I'm so glad to hear that you said that because I didn't know how to really explain that myself. I just do it as yeah. a coach. So that's, that's so awesome. Um, no, no, that's so cool. Now you mentioned the the lady you coached. Um, you were talking about from the collegiate standpoint. I wanted to pick your brain on the difference between like the collegiate game and the professional level athletes. Like, what's the biggest difference you notice between a professional tennis player and a collegiate tennis player? It's how hard they're willing to work, the extra time they're willing to put in, how hard they train and how hard they work, and how a lot of collegiate athletes are looking for the end of practice and the professionals, if they're not feeling good about where they were at, on that particular day, they don't leave the court. They just stay and they work hard, tremendously hard and they stay after and they do extra and they 
beg me to get two players to play against them at the same time so that they have to run harder. They don't care if they lose or not. they they got to be pushed. They've got to feel like I'm not only exhausted physically and mentally, but I got better today. And and from that, I learned that. And I would even tell my players before we'd start practice, they'd have a little three by five cards, but write down an area in in we had three areas. We had the emotional area, whether you get angry, how you stay focused. We had footwork and we had shot selection, the kind of ball you hit, you hit top spin, under spin, cross court, down the line, whatever. And they had to have a goal for the day, one goal for the day in each of those three areas. And then during practice, if I can tell they're not doing something, I say, which of the three are you working on right now? You working on your footwork? Because you're not moving your feet. You're working on being under control because you seem a little bit angry or you seem not motivated. I said, what are you trying to do here? Because otherwise you're wasting your time. So either we're either going to get better or you can go home. And, uh, and I, you know, it, it's, it's very different. I started going to China in 1989. And uh, that was the first time I went. And then about 1997 or 98, I started going every year and working with their national team. And my son, who was an All-American player and played for me and terrific player. And when I got back after about the second or third time over there, working with girls that won the Olympics in doubles, we're working with girls that won Wimbledon, won the US, won the Australian Open. He said, you're, you, you're, you know, remember, these guys aren't that good. He says, you were used to working with people that don't miss and they work hard. He said, you know, some of these guys are just, you know, they're just here having fun, you know? And I go, fun is winning, you know? And then he's trying to calm me down, you know, and say, <laughs> settle down, dad, settle down. You know, everybody, you can't push everybody like they're all, their only thing in life is to become a professional player. Because for most of them, it's to become an accountant or, a, you know, an entrepreneur or what, whatever their major is, whatever they're going to go in and do. So uh, I found that the difference was willingness to work hard, work ethic, and uh, and they were willing to, I mean, I'd go up and talk to, to some of the players and they'd get teary because I'd be a little rough and I'd go up to talk to the ones that were going to be really good players, professional players. And they would say, Hey, don't, don't sugarcoat it. If I'm playing like, you know what, just tell me I'm playing like, you know what? And they wanted to hear it straight and, and they were, and they could accept it because they were going to take responsibility. It wasn't that they were feeling like they were picked on or, you know, Somebody can feel like they're the whipping boy, but they're not. They're just somebody that has a lot of talent that you really want to help. That's that's so cool to hear. I I don't. Well, I guess I'll, I'll piggyback off of that and I'll ask you this. Then is there if there is an athlete right now, a, a tennis player that has aspirations to be a professional, not necessarily aspirations to be get a college scholarship and get their school paid for, but a, a aspirations to be a professional which athlete that you coached at the professional level would you advise them to study? Like go back and study film of so-and-so or somebody, maybe you didn't even coach them. Maybe you just were around them and you said, that's how, that's who you should emulate. That's who you should train. Like that's who you should study. Who would it be, Dave? I'd say on the women's side, it would probably be a girl from China named Jung Jia. And she was the first Asian girl to make top 15 in the world. She didn't get as high as another girl that I worked with, uh, Li Na, who, who won the French Open and won the Australian Open in singles. But Jung Jia was the first girl to make the top 15 in singles. She won Wimbledon. She won the Australian Open in doubles. And she is quite short, uh, stocky, strong. But her work ethic and her stroke production <clears throat> was exceptional. So on the girls' side, I'd say look at her or Lena. On the on the men's side, uh, men's side, there's two or three players. One from Taiwan who's living in Florida and coaching in Florida now, uh, who was, you know, number one in Asia, a great player, um, and uh, and in fact, he and my son were playing the Bryan brothers. Uh, uh, exhibition match and and they went out on the court and they're hitting and they started and and he aced them four times in a row and they're changing sides and and one of Mike Bryan goes I know you 
and and the way you Sue you says, yeah, I says we played in. He said, where where was that? He says we played in the in the Fiesta Bowl tournament in Phoenix. And he said, that's the worst I've ever been beaten in my life. He said, I've never cried so hard in my whole life. This is one of the Bryan brothers. who's the best doubles team in history. Wow. And uh, so, but he was a great player and and he worked hard and he had a big game. And uh, a player from mainland China, Yue Wong, and a player from the Czech Republic uh, who was, you know, when he, he was in school, he was 300 in the world. And he's playing in a division two school in Hawaii. But uh and and uh, Jan Krejci. So there's some terrific players that have worked hard and developed good work ethics, good strokes, good patterns, good self control. And I would probably direct them in those to watch those players. I love that. I appreciate that too. If you look back at your experiences, Dave, player, coach, um, parent, just looking back at the sport of tennis, what would you say was your favorite memory? Uh, during your career in the sport? That's a very good question. And uh, I think it depends where my mind is when I answer the question, because if I say I'm hired by the university, we're going to do a job. Uh, what's your best memory? Maybe be when both teams, men's and women's, won national championships in back-to-back -back years and hadn't been done before. And um, uh, so I think for the school that made them feel like the support that they'd given us uh, financially and otherwise was was rewarded. But I look back and I, I, I look at matches and I don't see results as much as I see kids and I see players and I see their personal growth and uh, some matches where a player's losing badly and, and we have a visit on the court and we talk about some things and talk about how to maybe change some things and they go out and they do do those things and and they win and they they are happy and they are excited to call home and tell the parents about the matches and uh i say some of those are great memories you know seeing people grow and develop and and um, become better people that's so awesome and I, I only had two questions left for you as we get towards the end of the interview dave this has been really insightful and i really appreciate it i I look at, you know, you mentioned a lot of names of the, the players you've coached and a lot of them have been international. I mean, it's not, it's been outside of the United States. They're, they're not American athletes. And I, and I wanted to touch base on this because um, in sports like basketball, obviously football, the, the dominant sports, even hockey and baseball, baseball is getting a little bit more international now. And so is basketball international is growing uh, soccer. America is trying to catch up. It feels like. So I wanted to get your take on that. Is it, does it feel like tennis is more like soccer in the sense of we're trying to build tennis as a, a dominant sport here in America and that internationally it's just levels above? Or how do you feel the U.S. compares uh, to the international side of things when it comes to tennis? I'd say in tennis, we're doing well. We, we in the late 60s and early 70s, we were dominant. So out of the top 100 men in the world, 60 of them were from the United States. Wow. And now it's maybe, you know, 12 or 14. Okay. But at this year's U.S. Open, we had four men in the final 16. And wow. we had we one of them already won today and made the quarterfinals. Another one's coming up to play next. And uh, so I'd say that, that and for the women, we've always done pretty well because we had the Williams sisters and – you know, and they were so dominant and Navratilova changed her citizenship and she and Chris Everett were dominant. And uh, so we've we've had some good runs. And Navarro, uh, who's playing, who won her match today, will be in the semifinal. She's the one that beat Coco Goff. We've got good young players that are coming up. So I'd say in tennis, we're not dominant as much as dominant as we used to be, but we have a very good pipeline of players. And I wouldn't say that we were behind if we have one negative thing about American players, I would say that it's our society and the entitlement that the kids feel today. And the kids from a lot of places around the world, they work harder. They're humbler. And they do it because this is their vehicle to get out of Dodge. You know, I, I can leave my country and go to America. I can get an education and I can play tennis. 
and I have a chance to become a professional player. And Americans like, well, if I don't make it, daddy, you'll pay my tuition. You know, it's a different mindset when you go to the court, if you have to do it versus, eh, well, if I make it, I make it. If I don't, I don't. And, and you know, those that want to be the best in professional sports, they've got to have that Michael Jordan attitude. And it doesn't come around very often. And it's harder to come around because of our society, I think, today. That is such a good point. And I, I, I there's so many golden nuggets out of this interview, Dave. I've, I've taken like little clips here. I'm going to be taking crazy amounts of notes because the entitlement is such a good point. That is such a good point. Oh, my goodness. It's a completely different uh, mindset. The psychological impact it has when you actually have something that you're, you're playing for as compared to something that's like, you have a back, like you have a plan B. Sometimes I feel like they have a, they, they feel like they have a plan B here, whereas some others it's plan A or bust, uh, wherever they're coming from. So, um, last question for you, Dave, okay. I want to know if you look back at your, your entire career, what would you say is the biggest life lesson that tennis has taught you? Probably that I can always do a little more that, that the game has comes back at you. Every time you start feeling like you've arrived, it just like life, it comes back and it says, no, you're not there yet. And, you know, you think I'm doing great. I got a great job. I just bought a house, you know, whatever else. And then the economy changes or you, you don't have your job anymore. Or, you know, the, the market changes and your house isn't worth what you paid for it or what. And you got to learn how to be resilient and deal with those kinds of situations. Tennis, I think, because it's individual and because you have to work so hard when you're doing it, really provides an opportunity to develop that resiliency and to develop what it takes to deal with the bumps and blows that, that come through life. That is awesome. I love that. And I'm just sitting here thinking as you're saying, it, I'm like, oh, man, how many times have we thought that? Yeah, I got the house. We're good. Oh, well. Cost of living has gone up. We got to work a little harder. <laughs> it's like yeah. everything, dude. Oh man, that's like so spot on, Dave. I love it, Dave. It's been an honor uh, chatting with you. I just appreciate your your willingness to to join me. For those who are listening, I uh, I was late to this by about five six minutes because I was having technical difficulties. So Dave was kind enough to be patient and wait on wait on me to get into the to the recording studio. So I appreciate that, Dave, and just appreciate your time. I'm going to be rooting you on and. Um, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for joining the show and being willing to share your story with us. Well, I appreciate it very much. And I'll thank Jackie for giving me this opportunity. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, Dave. You take care. For those who are listening, make sure to uh, follow us on YouTube as well as on Apple Podcasts or Spotify. Leave us a review and we'll be coming to you next week with another interview. Take care. Thank you so much. Guys, thanks so much for listening to another episode of my show. Now, if you could go and do me a favor, head over to iTunes, give me five stars and leave me a review. It would be greatly appreciated. Thanks, guys. Appreciate your support.